Hi, I'm, I'm Pat Gruber. I'm the CEO of Jivo. Today, I'm going to tell you about our company. Uh, the first thing, of course, is the forward-looking statement. The lawyers require this, and it is do not buy stock based upon anything I say and don't believe anything I say. That's the right way to interpret these things. Here's what we are about as Jivo. Renewable energy transformed into energy-dense liquids. Now, these liquids could are really the embodiment of renewable energy captures liquid that can be used for transportation fuels, diesel fuel, jet fuel, gasoline, or all things that we've worked with. It can be done with bunker fuel. And, uh, or it could actually be, you know, these are things that can be put back in and you can generate more electricity. The thing that is, that's interesting about these is that when you burn them, it's possible to achieve a net zero greenhouse gas emission footprint across the whole of the life cycle, all the way from capturing the carbon in the beginning from the atmosphere to burning it as a fuel and regeneration of it. And that's what I'll be talking about today in what we're doing as a company. Renewable energy transformed in energy dense liquids and, with, and we've named our first plant site net zero one. We're declaring what we wanna become and be and serve. The overview of us is that, you know, we've been around for quite a few years working on these technologies, perfecting them, developing the marketplace. It takes years to get products qualified and certified and available to fly on commercial airlines. That took six years alone. Um, we developed a huge patent portfolio worth that was recently estimated worth about $400 million. Um, we have identified a site at Lake Preston where we would build ourselves, Lake Preston, South Dakota, where we build ourselves a 45 million gallon per year plant with 365 million pounds per year of high protein feed. It's an interesting plant site. And that is sized to support our offtake agreements that we have in place. And in fact, we would use those to back the financing. Down to the lower left of the slide, you see the market traction. We have $1.5 billion worth of contracts that are take or pay uh, with pretty big name companies. And that 1.5 billion should be thought of, that's across the life of the agreements, call it six to seven years, 45 million gallons per year. Uh, and that's who we'd serve. We have a pretty big pipeline. I'll have a slide on that a little bit later. The pipeline is interesting. It's growing all the time, especially with the way the world is lining up and how important greenhouse gases are. On the lower right are all these different people who've worked with us over the years to qualify our products, make sure they work or put them in the infrastructure and do the testing. Other relevant information is that we have, as of 930, 80 million, 81 million in cash roughly, and the shares outstanding. Our uh, white box was our debt holder, they're gone now. Uh, and so we're a pretty clean balance sheet. This is the basic story. You all know what it is. Greenhouse gases are increasing. They're continuing to increase and uh, they're going up and up and up and up. And it is because fossil fuels get burned. And in fact, that's what this slide is trying to show is that the, uh, they've been increasing since people started burning oil. That's just a fact of life. It's indisputable, undeniable. And this is also true of coal and all the rest, but and natural gas. So that's what causes greenhouse gas emissions. You and I, as we drive or do anything, Every day, we help to contribute to it. And people often ask me, are temperatures rising? This is a study I pulled from NASA. It is interesting. This, is, this, is done, this study is done where they do a temperature anomaly based upon the year 1960. And it sure looks like it's increasing. It sure looks like it. These things are always hard to correlate and say it's a direct cause and effect. But you know what? That trend is pretty convincing. There's other things that go along too that we've seen it now, particularly in the world of COVID where pre-COVID, this is LA, pre-COVID and after people quit driving so much and that air quality makes a difference too. So what people forget is that when you're burning these fossil-based resources, you know, the petroleum stuff, it's full of all kinds of other stuff that's not good for us and pollutes. When you think about how to solve greenhouse gas problems across the world, you got to take a pretty big perspective. This is a chart from our world in data talking about global greenhouse gas emissions. People don't realize it, but 73% of global greenhouse gas emissions are directly related to energy. This is coal, natural gas, uh, and liquid transportation fuels. And uh, a lot of it is about electricity. You know, people like, for instance, and, and like electricity is going to continue to grow. There's still a billion people or so in the world without electricity. So we got a lot of work to do to change over this big energy system. There's things that are also interesting here. I'll point out iron and steel are 7.2% of global emissions and cement is like 3%. 
did you know wasting food, just wasting food off your table and in the supply chain? That's 6% of global greenhouse gas emissions. All right, we're focused on the liquid transportation part, transforming it, but actually you'll see that our business touches a whole bunch of these areas and sectors because we're involved with biogas, renewable natural gas, wind energy. We capture renewable energy and transform it into liquids. We capture carbon from the atmosphere and transform it into these energy dense liquids that can be used for transportation fuels. Here's a, here is a view of the world. This is by the uh, EIA. And this is a looking out to what is it happens in 2050. Now, remember the world's gonna grow and this is including their projection of the advent of EV and all the rest is that electricity comes into the transportation sector. That's good. This will probably be bigger with the new policies from the White House we'd expect. But you notice that it's gasoline is the big chunk then it's diesel fuel, then it's jet fuel. And on a, the big takeaway would here be say, wow, for all the work and all the talk, it sure looks kind of the same over the next 30 years. That's not good. We got to do something about it. We got to do something better about this. So here's a, here's a thought is that if we continued on kind of the same way and making the improvements and recognizing that there's more electrical demand that has to be done, electricity demand, and more, you know, the populations are increasing, there's more need for energy around the world. We're on a track that looks like this. That's not good. And this is what's causing behavioral change with customers in the marketplace. And they're not going to take it anymore. People, you see it with ESG and all the rest is that people are saying, no more. We got to change our ways. It's getting to be serious. And we're on a track where we got to do something different. And that's where we come in. There's lots of recent headlines. I'm not going to go over these, but you see all these companies out there making claims they want to be net zero in emissions. Well, how are they going to do that? You got to have renewable electricity, renewable gas. You got to have renewable liquid fuels. That's what it takes. How are we going to do it? Here's a concept that I want to show you. This is a chart that's doing life cycle emissions, you know, conventional cars against EVs of various countries. And EV, this is include, this is a full cradle to cradle type system. So it includes the batteries manufacturing the cars and all the rest. These are tailpipe emissions in this kind of a blue aqua color here. So what we're talking about as a concept is what happens if we remove those? Guess what? That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Because it says that, you know, we're right there competitive, except competitive with any of the EVs, even the ones that are the best with the most renewable energy, and if, if in fact we can pull this off and do it, and it seems we can, our products work in the, work in the marketplace. We just gotta get big, that's our goal. So capture renewable energy, photosynthesis captures carbon from the atmosphere. Think about the chemistry there, it's 400 ppm carbon pulled into plants and turned into a form that we can do chemistry and biology with it, uh, along with the energy that it contains. Then add some renewable energy, in the form of renewable natural gas, biogas, wind power, and you wind up with these liquid hydrocarbons, they're drop-ins. That means you can leverage all the existing infrastructure. You put it in, the consumer doesn't have to do anything different. They don't have to buy new equipment. No one has to buy new equipment. We had to build a new plant and supply it. Um, and uh, they have potential when they're burned to have net zero greenhouse gas emissions, according to the uh, Argonne's GREET model, which is the gold standard for measuring carbon emissions. Here's what's actually happened with fuels. People don't realize it. Over on the right side of the slide is octane, eight carbons long, hence the name octane. Jet fuel's got 12 carbons. You burn it, releases a lot of energy, makes carbon dioxide and water. We got to do the reverse, right? We got to go, we got to take the carbon dioxide and water and make do photosynthesis, make it into these hydrocarbon fuels. That's the chemistry that has to occur. Here's how we do it. Uh, we Photosynthesis makes a carbohydrate. That's part of the way there. These black ones represent carbon. Then we do, we have a proprietary technology that transforms the carbohydrates into a chemical called isobutanol. And this is really a building block molecule. It allows us then to do chemistry to finish it off and do the gasoline in the jet fuel. We've developed a proprietary yeast, genetically engineered it. People use the word synthetic biology to describe it. That's what we've done. It works. We've scaled it up. It works. The process works. And so now we're all focused on getting uh, this big plant, Net Zero One, built in Lake Preston. These are the markets I already talked about. It is interesting to note that carbohydrates are a, a very abundant feedstock. Corn in the Midwest, it makes for a good feedstock. This is the non-food corn. Uh, this is the, uh, it's, we separate the protein from the carbohydrates. And uh, that's what we do here. That's what makes sense. In other parts of the world, though, it'd be molasses or cane sugar, beet sugar, or it could be wood sugars. As soon as someone has a technology that's good, reliable, economic, and sustainable, we could use wood sugars or something, too, or from agricultural residues. Any kind of carbohydrate is fair game for us. 
and it makes the fuels that are droppings for these. The business system that we think about around net zero works like this. Carbon dioxide goes into the plants, gets carbohydrates out, we get the protein out, we separate the carbohydrates from the protein. The carbohydrates go into our plant the way I just described, we transform it into liquid fuels. And then when those get burned, they release carbon dioxide. Over here, we generate enormous quantities of protein and the protein goes into the food chain system. So it's no longer this idea of food versus fuel, it's food, we're doing both. You know, it's the carbohydrates that, that cause cows to burp and generate gas when you're growing them. You know, they, uh, they don't like that. They don't need carbohydrates like that, simple carbohydrates. They need complex ones. Well, starch is a really simple one. Well, strip it out, now you got a better quality animal feed product and enrich it for protein, and it's that much better for their growth. But that doesn't stop there. It's the other side of the cow you got to pay attention to, too. So we're setting up a uh, RNG project to capture manure and turn it into biogas to heat our plant. We'll feed it to our boilers. We are, at Net Zero One, we'd also have a big anaerobic digestion system for taking the agricultural residues or leftover stuff from the, from the corn and turn that into biogas as well to feed our plant and also to generate some electricity. To that, we would add wind power. We already installed wind power at our demonstration plant, our first plant up in Laverne. Uh, but that's how we think about things. You also, out of uh, anaerobic digestion, get a great fertilizer product that goes back to the field. So you capture the NPK, which is important as well. You do this well, and you can eliminate the carbon emissions. So if this black bar represents fossil GHGs, you change the carbon source, add renewable energy, you can drive them down to be zero or even lower. And that's what this chart shows is uh, an example of, if we just did on average of what's going on, uh, we could do this, you know, 20, uh, get to a 20 easily, a little more biogas, we can get negative. And if we went all biogas and wind, we can be very, very negative. If we took, if we incorporated the agricultural practices of how stuff's actually grown, you know, in, in, with advanced techniques that like in, like uh, um, locust does, you can get to very, very negative. This is part of the regenerative agricultural stuff. So here, this one over here on the left is assuming that just, we just had the average corn of the US. This one here assumes that we're using the corn that's grown around in the Lake Preston area. Pretty darn interesting. You know, one of the things that when we talk about it net zero at the tailpipe, that means it has to leave our plant at a very negative number already. That's something interesting because you're gonna burn it in the engine downstream of us. That's what happens. Here's something interesting is that in the agricultural systems, and I think we're seeing this change right now, you see it in the policies that uh, uh, the Biden administration has been talking about, is that they're focused on regenerative agriculture. It's good because agri soil is one of the very best ways of capturing carbon. If it's done right, right, it's gotta be done right. So in this picture here is a strip till. What, this, what they do is they plow like a, a six inch strip and leave all the root systems from the previous year in place. The next year, they'll move it over and, and plow where this uh, pile of roots is. What that does is it builds up soil carbon, keeps the NPK in, it's worth money for the farmer. They get better nutrition, better nutrients for their crop. Things grow better, the yields are better, everybody makes more money. It also captures a lot of carbon. And that's what you see over here in the reduced till corn, it turns out to be minus nine. This other one is a drill where they actually drill and plant corn. If we were to use that kind of farm to supply us, that would be a minus 37. The point of all this is that there's enormous potential upside. We don't take them into account in our economics and planning yet, but that's what's the way the world is trending. We like it. So that means that we got to keep track of things. We also have to be certified. So we work with RSB, the Round Table for Sustainable Business, that they use the UN principles and they've certified our farms some of our farms and ISCC plus is one of the leading sustainability group. And we've had them look at the greenhouse gas emissions around the agricultural systems to make sure that we're, we got our act together. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're setting up a uh, tracking system using blockchain. Everybody knows what blockchain is. Well, what we figured out as a way to keep track of farms, put it through our plant, keep track of the mix of renewable energy we'd put to it, how to attach it and send it downstream to customers. You'll see more about that as we get this thing going. It's kind of interesting and it's bigger than Jivo as a tool, but we made a prototype, it works, we like it. We got to figure out how we're going to use it best, but I can think it, think of it as electronic certification of our products. That will be easy. We could even attach all kinds of other sustainability attributes like showing in fact that no, 
this farm hasn't changed in size. They didn't plow down any new prairie and stuff like that. We can address a lot of issues. This is about the jet fuel. Jet fuel, of course it works. It's flown on all these kind of things. Um, we've done projects all over the world where people have flown with our stuff. You know, our, our gasoline product is used for F1 racing, supplied by Haltman Carlos. It's a premium gasoline product. This isn't a low quality product. It's a very high quality, high energy product, high octane product. That's what makes it nice. And that's why people are interested in it. The, what, what's changed in the marketplace and why we have a potential business at all is that carbon is now starting to be valued in bigger and bigger markets. And what I mean by that is California, with its low carbon fuel standard, is able to attribute value to decarbonization. They call it CI points, carbon index. They're worth about two cents, so uh, a carbon index. So if you say, well, gee, we're going to go you know, from 100 down to 40, that's 60 CI points, that's worth $1.20 a gallon. Okay, that generates value. Then you have RCFS or EU Red does it differently. There's other tax credits and there's other things that are developing. And sometimes there's just mandates. The point of this is that there's carbon value that's generated. It's really decarbonization value that's generated. What has happened then is that we share that with the customer and we keep some for ourselves. So the way to think of it is this, is that well, here you have the cost of a fossil-based fuel. They, the customer wants to have a net price that's pretty darn close. Our stuff is generally cleaner, less pollutants and all the rest, so we can get a premium for it straight away on technical properties. But if we share some of that carbon value, then it gets it back up to a base contract price. How that, so that's generally how we would go about this. We'd set a base contract price, share some of the values so from a customer point of view, it nets out to be fairly cost competitive. On our side of the ledger, we have our base contract price. And then we, can't, we take frequently the majority of the economics related to carbon value and attribute to ourselves, and that gives our total revenue, and then that gives us our cash margin. So a good way to think of us is that we truly are in the business of reducing carbon and getting paid for it and setting up business systems that can do it, and that's what makes our net zero project so interesting. This is the pipeline of our uh, customers is that we have about 48 million gallons under contract. 45 million gallons is the initial size of our plant. It's split roughly 50-50 between gasoline and jet fuel. You, the contracts for negotiation are pretty substantial. It adds up to about 343 million gallons in discussion negotiation. And I think in the end, it'll be split between jet fuel and gasoline. It's hard to predict because these guys are changing their minds all the time. But the traction is increasing. And so we expect to announce additional customers. Our Net Zero One project, I mentioned it for Lake Preston. It's a world scale project, 45 million gallons, and it'll have 350 plus million pounds of animal feed. We generate our own boiler gas on site and plus enough biogas to do about 30% electricity. We bring in wind energy from a project that's related to us. We also are doing an RNG project where it is a, uh, you know, we could, we could bring that to the plant as well. The total capital cost we expect is between seven to 800 million, depending upon how much renewable energy uh, generation we do on that site and what, what additional infrastructure we put in. And we're, we are working with Citigroup on that. So here's how we think this will unfold, is look at this right side of the slide, the net zero one production plan. We'd fund part of it, equity partners would fund part of it, debt would fund the rest. City's got the debt solution in hand, they believe. Uh, so good, we'll see it. We're working with, we got term sheets from equity partners who wanna play with us. And of course we have an ability to put money in as well. But we have more than that. We are the licensors of technology. We're the developers, we get paid for that or get reimbursed for that. We have, uh, we're going to have to operate the plants because we're the people with the expertise to do so. So we get paid for that. So we got a, multiple bites at apples to make money. We see net zero one is the first of the plant, but of course, then you can tell what we're thinking is that we hope to have someday a net zero two and a zero three, et cetera. The city group has done, city group has done a great job working with us, uh, you know, educating the marketplace about what's possible with us and all the rest. And, uh, it's going to be interesting. It'll take about the rest of this year to finish off the detailed engineering. We'd expect to close a deal, you know, the financing sometime late this year, early next year. We have other opportunities uh, for net zero too. Those would be in Asia, India, for example, in EU. Those will be fun to talk about and they'll happen, I think, pretty suddenly. 
it is possible with us, our balance sheets improve dramatically. So we'd be, before we used to think we'd just be stuck with a development fee uh, or, you know, a residual. I think we can do a little more than that now and invest. We'll see. And now what do we touch? We touch obviously transportation fuels. We have building blocks that can go into the chemical industry. For instance, we can make butylene and supply that. We have a technology that converts to make uh, the raw materials to make PET plastic. We could send our stuff that direction if we wanted to in the future. We obviously hand, are talking about doing stuff with manure, fixing the manure problem and livestock problem, both in the front end and on the back end, making anaerobic, doing anaerobic digestion. And, and, you know, in Asia, in India, you know, you have Praj over here working on how to use rice straw as a feedstock. That's pretty interesting because your rice straw, instead of burning it just to get rid of it, convert it into sugars. We can use, we're gonna, we can use uh, landfill gases or other things and transform them. So it's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting thing. You start thinking about all the places we touch where we can help people reduce carbon. So these are takeaways. We transform the renewable energy and energy, energy dense liquids that have potential for net zero across their whole life cycle. They work in transportation fuels, the production processes work. It's all about for us building the big plants. Uh, uh, it's huge markets. We've got strong partners, strong players. These net zero projects appear to have an IRR of plus 20%. Uh, we're making good progress on that. And uh, We've got all the money we need on the balance sheet to go ahead and do the development and stuff like that. So that's got massive change for those of you who met me a year ago. Uh, so we're looking forward to getting on with this. And so this is a slide I leave you with. Again, it's a different paradigm, right? Capturing a variety of renewable energy sources with renewable carbon, you produce them. It's really interesting because you can store the, it's, it's, it's like liquid renewable energy. And then it can go into a variety of places with existing infrastructure. So with that, I'm, finished. Great. Thank you, Pat, uh, for such a comprehensive uh, presentation. We have a little time for Q&A, and so as we pull for questions from the audience, uh, you can hit the lower right-hand uh, part of your screen. There's a bubble that you can submit questions, um, and we'll see those. But in the meantime, Pat, we, you know, congratulations. You had a, a couple milestones that you hit you know, that you talked about, one is becoming debt-free. You know, that was clearly a, uh, a major milestone given that that maturity was at the end of the year. Then secondly, you know, you did announce the location for the first plant, you know, the Greenfield plant. You did switch that from Luverne to, to Lake Preston. Um, and then you have the, you know, feed engineering company, Coke, involved now. Can you walk us through some, and then actually you talked about, you know, the financial close potential at the end of the year, maybe early next uh, next year. Can you walk us through some of the other milestones that you're looking at over the near term that we might, you know, be able to mark some of the progress with from we, when we look at the rest of the year? Sure. On the customer front, you should expect additional customer contracts. It's always really, really hard to, to say when those things are going to occur because they're generally pretty big. If you recall the Tropagura agreement equated to in the, in the press release about $900 million for the 30 million gallons, right? Across the life of the contract. Well, those are the kind of orders of magnitude we're talking about. And because they're take or pay contracts, these are non-trivial contracts to get approved at, at the customer side, right? Because people are saying there's something about their balance sheet that's tied up. It's take or pay. So this is why it takes so long, but we're going to have several of those I would expect through the course of the year. And I can't predict the timing. I'm terrible at it because it, we don't, that they get to control that pace. But if we get one, then we got to go to net zero two. That's the interesting implication. And if we get another one, then it's net zero three. It's that kind of a game. Okay. And we have multiple sites identified already. So we feel pretty good about that. Um, the other one is that we've been working on this RNG project. We've talked a little bit about it, not in, not in gory detail. And we'll, we're working and doing the finishing of the engineering there. And uh, we'll be talking about how that gets financed and, you know, in the not too distant future, meaning, you know, sometime in the first half of the year, we'll do it. But it's a, that's interesting because that's a business unto itself. We'd own it, uh, presumably. Uh, and, we would, uh, that would be available to sell to the market or to RNGs to the marketplace in California, for example, or take it to our net zero plan when it's built. We have those things. Um, and there's lots of other 
little milestones that we'd have along the way. I never know what's going to trigger our stock. I have no idea. I mean, I don't know. I guess the questions I get most often are one is, you know, you've named the engineering company and it's Coke mm -hmm. um, and you're going to, you know, they'll do the feed work and then you'll have specs to, to bid out. When, when do you anticipate naming a, an EPC contractor? Late this year, probably. And so, you know, the Coke obviously is a, they're capable of doing that, but there's other ones as well. And so we'll, we'll work through the process in a normal way and go figure it out and, and bring them in. Coke is interesting because Coke is a company who does, who's been around fermentation and the hydrocarbon side of thing, both. And that's lost on people. And so there's a few significant things. One, it's Coke Industries is supportive of what we're doing. That's good. Some people you know, they're like, well, you know, we don't like Coke because they're, they're, they're the petrochemical people. I was like, I got news. The people with expertise that I need are from the petrochemical industry. I got to work with somebody. And they're pretty good because they also have fermentation stuff. And they also are familiar with biogas and a whole bunch of other things in the infrastructure. So it's a little bit different. And the world has changed. And I think that's how people should read it. The world has freaking changed. That's how, that's what people should read. How it, what it leads to with them, you know, is like they're doing a great job on the engineering and we'll see where it goes from there. But it's got to be a competitive process on the EPC front. Yep. And then uh, from a standpoint of, you know, you sort of alluded to adding Coke as a major partner. Uh, could they potentially be an equity investor? And also, could you just combine it with also adding tra Trafigura? I mean, these are two major names within the energy, you know, en energy market. And, you know, it's... Uh, there are a, a multitude of potential avenues of collaboration, right? Yeah, there is. And it goes, the list is, the list is pretty big. And so it's one of those things where our city's done a good job of helping us work through that, collect term sheets from people and sort it out. And, you know, it's an interesting game to play and we got to work it out. And we have a little bit of time because we still are doing the feed, the front end engi engineering. So we got to work it and do it in its systematic process um, I got to tell you, though, these big dogs, you know, if there's big dogs out there in the hunt, you know, they all look at it and go, yeah, what about that? There's a big dog in there already. Or, you know, it's a it's a we got to do a balancing act here and stuff. So, you know, we got a lot of work to do sorting out the relationships, who's who, what's what. It also matters as to, you know, where are these customer contracts? What's net zero two? What's net zero three? You know, what do they look like? And that impacts how people think about it too. So I'll tell you one thing that's great. We're in a good place. I got the engineering money. I got the money to do the development work. I got money to uh, completely different. Remember where we were. I had to go get money just to do the simple engineering work. You know why we can have these breakthroughs in thinking about net zero one is because now I'm spending the money in the engineering to go, what's the very best way we can optimize for renewable energy and capture it and put it into our products? You know, so it's a, you're getting a, we're getting a different set of answers. It's all straight, straightforward stuff, but from a new paradigm. And now I have the money to spend on getting the engineering done. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And that really drove the decision to, to switch from converting or modifying Laverne to doing a whole grain fail plant that you really have a, you know, an optimal design, everything from an input standpoint and output standpoint to optimize the carbon, you know, reduction, right? You got it. So that's the whole thing. So we think differently about it as we design. So we're de designing as if we aren't just treating it as, oh, look, it's $4 a million BTU natural gas that's fossil based. We're treating it as no, 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 no. It's $35 gas. Now, how do we optimize that gas? Because it's renewable gas. Or it's a, you know, we're looking at how to use wind electricity better. Or if we're going to generate electricity on site with combined heat and power, how do we best use that? And so it's a whole variety of things that come into play. And so as we think about it, it's like, you know, you can see how we would think about the optimization of it, depending upon what kind of corn, where did it come from and what its footprint is against what do we use wind today? Do we use biogas, and digestion gas? Do we use, you know, there's a whole variety of things that we can think about that's different. Because remember, we get paid for, in the future, we'd expect to get paid for the carbon value reduction. That's a different business. Yeah, there's a base commodity price. And yeah, our stock is particularly clean in terms of it doesn't have sulfur or the particulates or some of these other things. But it's really what differentiates us then is the ability to achieve the a low carbon footprint. And when you look at it, um, I saw the press release this morning about 
you know, one of the co-founders of Jibo being appointed to um, the new administration's uh, science team. Can you maybe talk about the significance of that and also in the context, Pat, that, you know, we're not looking for any federal legislation to further the concept. I mean, it's it stands alone on itself, given what the current carbon values are out there, you know, mainly as you talked about in California and other places. But you, what kind of legislation do you think might be coming down the pike that might be even more supportive of your of your concept? Well, in Europe, I can see it more clearly. In Europe, you know, you have France putting in mandates. You have Scandinavia, some of the countries there are putting in mandates. You're having the price of carbon is pretty high. They're forcing companies to comply. So they're much more advanced than here in the U.S. And that shouldn't be lost uh, on anybody that that's important. You have other considerations that are interesting, like in India. India, these technologies are good enough now. They actually work. And so you have a country like India where they're going, hmm, I think I have a lot of excess residues and stuff that we haven't been using or it's been waste or whatever. And we can transform this into these jet fuels and gasoline products. And then you have in here in the States with the, the Biden administration, I'm waiting with, I want to see what happens. You know, we'll see. They're talking about, I'm hearing the right things so far. That's for sure. And so what will it be really? And how does it manifest? You know, and what will happen to the RFS? So I think on a fundamental level, there'll be a national policy and it'll be strengthened in some way, I hope. I just don't know the form and function exactly. I'll tell you what I like, though. I've heard lots of talk in the last week or so about regenerative agriculture. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about with keeping the root systems intact and building up soil carbon. I like that a lot because that's really good for the farmer. It's good for uh, the soil capturing carbon. And of course, if I'm counting carbons, I like it a lot, lot. Yep. And does Frances Arnold add anything to the equation? Is, is she familiar with the technology potentially? And Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, uh, uh, Frances was a co-founder of Jivo back in the day. And, you know, originally she was on our board and she's, we have, a, she worked on some of our technologies early on, but we really, she did, she's not involved with our company. And so, um, and so who knows, you know, that's a separate thing. It's a, it's a nice, good for her. And she's a good, bright, rational scientist who'll bring, you know, good thinking to the table. Great. But it's nothing to do with us. Yep. And just to, to rewind on the, the question about just the federal potential legislation, you don't, you're not incorporating any potential changes in your economics going forward. It's, it makes sense right now, given where mar energy markets are and where, you know, jet fuel and, and renewable and gasoline, you know, might land. Yeah, it seems. So this is this point about that carbon value being firmed up to a place where people believe it are now, that's a big deal change. And it's only been for maybe the last couple of years that it's been that way. That's not, maybe not even that long where people now are going, oh yeah, we really are going to get held accountable for our carbon footprint. We have to do something. That's a new thinking. So on top of it, the ESG stuff, you know, that's happening where, you know, where people are, there's, you got activist shareholders and all the rest. And I just want to know how we got a lot of work to do, man. You know, it's like everyone talks about, well, oh, we're just going to make everything. We're going to get rid of gasoline by making electric vehicles. Yeah. Okay. Wait, how long is that going to take? And what's going to happen? I, and we do need that. We do. It works great in some places probably. Right. But we got to have green electricity then or green hydrogen. Cool. Let's have them. Let's get at it. Well, guys like us can help that kind of stuff occur because we're building infrastructure in a different way, right? And we can also leverage then, you know, if people didn't have to buy a new car, you know, you can just reduce your carbon footprint. That That's conceivable. You know, that could be done. And that's interesting. Yeah. And um, you alluded to it before, but, you know, with the balance sheet now debt free, with a lot of cash on the balance sheet to fund the development work, you know, first the feed and then potentially invest in RNG. Are you, you did update your ATM offering prospectus recently. What's your, and I know you can't be specific, but what's your general strategy on using the ATM, ATM and maybe a better way to ask it too, is how much cash would you be comfortable having on your balance sheet to make sure that you're, you know, that you have the right seat at the table at when all the economics of the equity investments are, are being discussed at net, for instance, net zero one. Yeah, that's a tough one. I can't comment on the ATM. Uh, and so it's, but, you know, it's a practical matter. 
when you have a stronger hand, you you get to you get to play the game differently, right? I can tell you that we were very very weak in the past, and that so we were relegated into the role of saying the best we can do as a developer, and our hat is in our hand, and we're having to it's literally hand to mouth. That's not the situation anymore. So now we get to be more of a player. And so when you you know for us have been able to put in equity, think about it. These plants, the way we project them, they're the IRR is above twenty percent, right? These are good investments. So I think about that. I like that. And, you know, and so this is like one of these cases where it's a good investment, coincide strategically. Yeah, having more money in the balance sheet's a good thing. But, and so, you know, we're not stupid. So it's a, um, it's not lost on us. And, you know, we don't like to be taken advantage of all that kind of stuff. How it all unfolds, don't know yet. Yep. Can you walk us through, you sort of talked about shifting from just, you know, capturing the development fees and then your contracts capture some of the, the value of the CI reductions or the carbon index reductions. What, what are other potential revenue sources uh, when you look at sort of the model right now? Yeah, right now we would see that we get paid an operating fee we would get paid, you know, we get reimbursed for the development expenses. So that's like a, that's a significant chunk of change, right? Cause all these engineering fees that we're spending with Coke and whatever that would get reimbursed to us. And uh, we might turn right around and put it back into the equity in the plant or something, but it would in fact get reimbursed to us. So our expenses that you see a lot of them, as we spend money this year, a lot of that stuff we would anticipate getting reimbursed. So you have that. We also have other potential streams. I'm not sure how this blockchain thing, we're getting a lot of interest for the blockchain thing of how to track carbon from a farm through a production process, mix of renewable energy out to the marketplace. That's got, that's going to be interesting. I don't know how it's going to play out yet. I got to figure it out, but I do know that, you know, we're going to try to, we're going to try to make that. And that could be a new revenue stream. Um, we have other things that are coming down, which are like, um, you know, will we sell, will we sell side streams? We'll figure that out later. I'm not going to focus on it today it's because it's a potential for the future like for instance making the stuff for pet plastic or for polybutylene rubber we could do that I mean, we, we've done it we can do yeah. it we'll have the capability so it isn't a we're not a what i like our our business system is not a one trick pony i like that a lot we got and now that remember we can change the ratio of the octane to the jet fuel so we're not even beholden to any one of those markets, we can change and adjust. Oh, and you know what? If I want to make diesel, uh, we know we know how to do that too. So many other people are doing uh, doing it that we don't bother with it. But someone recently asked me if you could make bunker fuel, and the answer is yes, we can make bunker fuel because you know bunker fuel people use some of the diesel fuel for bunker already. So yeah. you know it's a different paradigm. Yeah, I did notice your last cor corporate presentation. What you filed on Friday did have a shift in the you know, the jet fuel versus the gasoline or isobut, it did flip a little bit. Yeah, so, we don't even, you know, it's, you know Frank, frankly, right now, that's, you know, we're even focused on it at all. It's all about the hydrocarbons, energy dense liquids. This is the thing that resonates is that because people know that is we chain, how will you do long haul transportation? How will you do airplanes? How will you do shipping? How will you do those places in the country that don't have good electrical infrastructure to change to EV or hydrogen or whatever. Good. People like us can help solve those problems. Oh, in the meantime, we're in renewable energy generators ourselves, right? We're involved with renewable natural gas and biogas and wind. We're, you know, we are the ones capturing carbon dioxide. You see, car I've seen lots of commercials on TV from folk talking about how they're going to capture it. Hey, guess what? We know how to do that and make food yep. products. Well, I'm Pat, as you can probably tell, I'm getting the hook a little bit. But thank you so much for a great uh, presentation. Love the Q&A. And also um, look forward to seeing you on the panel tomorrow afternoon on the energy panel. Thank you for, for participating um, and have a great day. And let's see what the stock does. I, I'm afraid to look. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thanks a lot, Pat.